So, our keynote speaker tonight is Dr Becky Smethurst, who's based at the University of Oxford. She's an astrophysicist and she's a science communicator. And given that communication is her expertise, I think I shouldn't spend too long talking here, but rather invite her to come to the lecture and uh, talk to us about her research and how she combines it with other things that she does. Welcome, Becky. <laughs> Let's just give the laptop a, a minute. <laughs> it's been shut for a while, so there we are. All right, first of all, I am delighted to be here this evening. Uh, this wonderful celebration. Congratulations to all of the award winners. It's been so lovely to hear about your enthusiasm for what you do, all of your efforts. It's so, so inspiring. So congratulations again to all of you. Now, the organizers have asked me to speak tonight to give you an overview of both my research, which is about how supermassive black holes grow. And you see on this slide, this is my very professional persona, you know, RES, research fellow, University of Oxford but also my other persona, which is your friendly neighbourhood astrophysicist on YouTube. And the organisers have asked if I'd therefore share with you my lessons that I've learned doing online science communication for the past five years. So this really is going to be a talk of two halves. We're going to do a big jump in the middle. Don't be too <laughs> shocked when we do that. Uh, we're really going to have one half on astrophysics and one half on YouTube. I'll let you guys decide which one is the most interesting of those topics. <laughs> Tell me later. So let's jump in and start with the astrophysics and start with black holes. Now a black hole is an object so dense that the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. And nothing can travel faster than the speed of light according to Einstein's theory of special relativity. So we get no light and therefore no information from a black hole. And I often think that dark star would be a better word to call black holes than black holes because the term black hole <laughs> causes so much confusion amongst the general public. People picture a literal hole in space and it's the exact opposite of that. They're more like mountains of matter millions to billions of times heavier than the sun just crushed all into one space now you might remember this image from a few years ago um, i dubbed it the giant orange donut because i personally thought there was no other phrase better to describe it what you're actually seeing here is light emitted from the regions around a black hole now specifically radio emission and the reason that this is happening is because the material that's giving off this light is moving so incredibly fast, it's accelerated to such huge speeds by the black hole that you have incredible friction, the material starts to heat up and it starts to glow. And so that's how we can even see black holes and know that we're there is the influence on the material and the environment around them. The specific one I'm showing here is the supermassive black hole at the centre of a galaxy called Messier 87. It's 6.5 billion times heavier than the sun and the entire solar system could fit inside of the region that we don't get any light from. Just let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> I never get tired of looking at this image, especially because, you know, People ask me, oh, what's the difference though? You've got this big orange donut and there's black on the inside and there's black on the outside, so what? And it's like, well, the black on the outside is empty space. There's nothing there. And yet the black on the inside is because there's everything there that's literally trapping the light so that we can't see it. So we can see this even though it is 50 million light years away. Now, supermassive black holes, to understand them, we have to really understand where we find them, right? We find them at the centres of galaxies, so islands of billions of stars in our universe. The Milky Way is our galaxy. The sun is just one star of hundreds of billions. And this is a Milky Way look-alike galaxy. We can't actually take an image of the Milky Way. We're stuck inside it. We have to send some sort of spacecraft 100,000 light years up and above it and turn it around and look 
back down. Um, I don't know about you, but I won't live that long, so we'll never see it. Uh, but roughly speaking, this is what the Milky Way looks like. Beautiful spiral galaxy. If you saw it on its edge, it would be very, very flat like this. The Sun and the solar system are roughly speaking sort of out on the edge of our galaxy, sort of like in the suburbs, if you think of it like a city of stars. Whereas the supermassive black hole is found right in the centre. And we think every galaxy in our universe has a supermassive black hole in its centre, with all the stars orbiting around it, just like with planets orbiting around the Sun and the solar system. So we can actually point our telescopes towards the centre of the Milky Way, it's the constellation of Sagittarius, the best views down in the Southern Hemisphere. If you ever go on holiday further south, you might have spotted it. And what you're seeing behind me is a series of images taken over a number of years. You'll see the, the year ticking over in the bottom uh, right here as well. And what you can see is the stars orbiting around that very centre, where we don't actually see anything there. And what's great is if you model the star's orbit, how fast they're going, you can work out how massive the thing is that they're orbiting around. And when you do that, you find out it's an object that we can't see that's four million times the mass of the sun that could easily fit inside the orbit of Mercury. The only thing it could be, or at least with hindsight we now know, is a supermassive black hole. There was some debate in the 90s and 80s over whether it was a swarm of much smaller black holes, which I kind of wish was true, because I almost feel like a swarm of black holes is cooler than a supermassive one, but it was a supermassive black hole. And it was actually this work that won Andrea Getz from UCLA a Nobel Prize in 2020, measuring the mass of the Milky Way's black hole in this way with this series of images. Now, four million times the mass of the sun might sound large, um, it's actually on the piddly side for supermassive black holes, to be quite honest, at least compared to the amount of mass in stars that the Milky Way has. So I'm about to show you the first graph of the talk. I figured we're all scientists here, right? I can go into a little bit of detail, just not too much because it's still a Wednesday evening and my head already hurts from the week, so we're not going to go into too much detail, I'm sure you're all the same. But what we can see here is there is a very clear correlation between the mass of a supermassive black hole, which on the y-axis here, it's a log logarithmic scale, so 10 to the 6 means a million times the mass of the sun, 10 to the 9 billion times the mass of the sun. And on the x-axis, yeah, you've got the mass in stars in the galaxy that the black hole is in. And yeah, there's a lot to scatter, we're all used to that as scientists, right? But roughly speaking, supermassive black holes tend to be around about 1% of their galaxy's mass. But the Milky Way's black hole is less than that. This little blue star just popped up there. You can see it's around about 0.1% of the mass of the Milky Way. So that's why I mean by it. it's slightly piddly. So we need some way of explaining what causes this correlation. How does a black hole even become this big in the first place, so supermassive? Because the only process that we know that forms a black hole is a supernova, when a star dies, runs out of fuel. But that only produces a black hole anywhere from five to a hundred times the mass of the sun, how do you get it to a billion times the mass of the sun? We need some process that's going to drive material towards the black hole, actually get it close enough to the black hole, get it to lose angular momentum as well so that the black hole can actually take in that material, use it to grow in mass. But also you need a process that grows the galaxy at the same time, otherwise you wouldn't get this correlation that we see. So the big idea for the past 20 or so years, 25, 30, is that the way that this happens is from the merger of two galaxies. And that is the, in fact, the eventual fate of the Milky Way and its closest nearest neighbour, Andromeda. We are just slowly moving towards each other uh, over time. Don't worry, nothing to worry about, two billion years to go yet. They are both beautiful spiral galaxies now, but in a couple of years' time, they're expected to collide and merge together. And in that process, you shift energy around, reduce the force of gravity, you reduce the angular momentum in some of the gas in the galaxy, which can then fall towards the center, towards the black hole. Two supermassive black holes in two galaxies as well, if they come together, they're thought to merge but also you trigger a load of new stars to form in, in, in the galaxy that you form at the end, just this giant sort of 
blob of a galaxy. The scientific term is elliptical, but I, I honestly prefer the word blob. And that's the result of if you take two galaxies and you merge them together, that are about the same sort of mass-ish. Andromeda's a bit heavier than us, but almost the same mass. But if you have a much smaller galaxy, like the one that you can see just behind here, where is it, that blue one up there? And that's one of our nearby galaxies called the Triangular Galaxy. It's much less than 10% of the size of the Milky Way. That's not going to be as drastic of a merger. It would sort of be like dropping a pebble, pebble into a pond. You'd probably keep your spiral nice shape of the Milky Way, but you would build up a little blob or so in the middle where you have, again, you know, sort of changed all the orbits of the stars in this sort of like scrambling that a merger creates. Kind of picture it like a fried egg shape is what you end up with if you have a less destructive merger. Either way, what you've done with the merger is grown your galaxy and grown your supermassive black hole in one fell swoop. And so people were like, this is what causes the correlation that we see. Job done. And we see this in snapshots across the universe happening, right? We don't actually get to see mergers play out. They take billions of years, so we see them just as they are. So these are separate different pairs that we see with the Hubble Space Telescope, just showing you some examples here, different states of mergers as well, coming closer together, and then finally sort of in like a, a post-merger phase as well. But these sort of images, and then like, together with like the simulation that I just showed, <coughs> help us put together this picture of the effect of mergers of galaxies and supermassive black holes, and it's what we think leads to this correlation. We call it co-evolution of galaxies with their black holes. So galaxy mergers with all of the scrambling of stars' orbits and gas in a galaxy, putting it down into the supermassive black hole in the center, we have thought this was the way that supermassive black holes grow over time. The problem with that picture, though, is that not all galaxies have had a merger. Not all of them are these big blobs that result from a merger. Some of them are still beautiful spiral shapes, just like our own Milky Way galaxy. So what about in galaxies like this? The one on the left there is Andromeda, right, our nearest neighbour. We think it has had a merger in the past with something a little bit smaller than itself because it's got that sort of like big blob in the center. It looks like a fried egg, right? You've got the big blob in the center, you've got the sort of egg white on the outside, which is that like spiral shape of the galaxy. It's nice and flat, all of the stars are orbiting nice. Uh, on nice orbits, whereas in the very center, it's, you can picture it more like a beehive. They're also orbiting the center, but none of them are on a flat plane. It's sort of just like chaos in the center. But what about on this side here? That doesn't have a bulge, a blob in the center. It's clearly never had a merger. It's been left alone its entire life, and it's been left with this gorgeous spiral shape. They're kind of like, to really labour this analogy of the fried egg, this is the egg white omelette of the galaxy world, right? You've just got a nice flat galaxy. And my research question was essentially, what about the black holes in these things then? Because if we think all galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the centre, and these things have never had a merger, which is the one process that we think grows supermassive black holes and galaxies, what happens in the centre of these things? And how big are the supermassive black holes in the centre of galaxies that are bulgeless, that have never had a merger? So the first thing you've got to do, as we all know as scientists, right, is you've got to go out and collect some data. You've got to get a sample of these bulgeless galaxies, but specifically ones that also have what we call an active black hole. Remember I said the reason we know that these supermassive black holes are there is because they light up with all the material spiralling around them? That's how we know they're there, and it's also how we can study their properties as well, because the stuff around them is lighting up. So what we did was went through what's known as a survey uh, of data from a telescope that literally just keeps scanning the sky as its job and builds up a big picture of the sky. From all those images, we could then go through. There's was about a million images, and we managed to select these 100 galaxies that looked as if they had never had a merger, they were nice and flat, the egg white omelettes, but they also had a growing supermassive black hole that we could see that it was there because it was lighting up in the middle. You should be able to see them in the images in the centre as well if you look. It's also a slightly different colour, sort of like a slight purplish dot in the very centre, and that's because 
the supermassive black hole, it's very energetic, so it's giving out more light in sort of like the UV end of the light spectrum, whereas the stars in the galaxy, which are giving out light more in sort of like the optical and the infrared, they appear much more yellow in these images. So you could argue, okay, well, you could be hiding a little bit of a bulge under that big bright purple dot that you've got in the center of a lot of these images, um, but mostly you can see that they are all disdominated. And these works are disdominated bulgeless. So these were taken from the ground, these images. So a little bit fuzzy, but it was a good start because then once we had this sample of 100, we could then be like, hi, folks who run the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> could we please use it to check that they are indeed bulgeless? And that is exactly what we did. We got some follow-up observations, and I think it was all but one of them turned out to be bulgeless galaxies that had never had a merger. So we were pretty proud of our selection uh, using the sort of fuzzy data that we did have and then getting this beautiful Hubble Space Telescope uh, data of all of these things. Now what we really want to do with these galaxies is measure the mass of the supermassive black holes in the centre to see where they lie on that correlation that we saw before. Everyone says, well, this comes from mergers. These are not kind of merger, how they rely on that correlation. So to get at the mass of the black hole, you don't need an image, you need what's known as a spectra. Where you take a light, split it through a prism, and get a trace of how much light each wave you receive. I'm sure people have all used spectra in various different forms of science. So to do that, some poor sod's got to go to a telescope and observe these things. Lucky me, got to go to the Canary Islands in La Palma. It's a hard life, I know. <laughs> I love this image because it takes people a little while to process what they're actually seeing. But in the background there, that's clouds but you're above the clouds because you're on a mountain top here with the telescopes. It's a very strategic place to put telescopes because you usually end up above those cloud inversion layers, less atmosphere to look through, uh, and much better conditions for using uh, a telescope. Uh, that's sunset as well, and I had just woken up because my work day is about to start, but it's night time because I'm an astronomer. And we were using a telescope called the Isaac Newton Telescope, the INT, it's a UK-owned telescope. The mirror inside that big dome there that's housing the telescope is two and a half metres across, that's what collects the light. But then you can see underneath that big round dome, there's then a huge building. And that was built in the 70s to house the astronomers when you go to use the telescope. So it's got kitchens and bathrooms and, you know, sort of like bedrooms in there that you can sleep in during the day and then work at night. Since that telescope was built, though, there's been a lot more other telescopes built on the mountain, and so now there's like a central residential area that everybody sleeps in, like a, like a little mini hotel kind of thing. The hotel is kind of good. Um, little, little area that everyone <laughs> sleeps in right, its own building. So you've got the telescope dome, and then you've got three or four floors of essentially an abandoned 70s building that is like a time capsule to the 70s still. But at night, when you're taking data and you need the loo, <laughs> That's where your bathrooms are, and you can't turn on a light for fear of any light leaking and ruining the data that you're taking on the telescope. So picture this. You need the loo in the middle of the night, like with two people working at the top of a deserted mountain, and you have to walk through an abandoned 70s building in the dark to try and find that loo. It is utterly terrifying. It's like you can hear the theatre room of people just like screaming at you to turn on a light. <laughs> Please turn on a light because something's going to jump out of you. It's terrifying, but it's worth it for science, right? This is why we do these things. So what we were trying to do was observe that sort of glowing light from around the supermassive black hole. Mostly it's from hydrogen most common element in the universe, that's what ends up sort of spiraling around it will eventually grow the supermassive black hole. But luckily for us, it also lights up. So, in a physics talk, we now need some chemistry. Chemistry 101, who knew? If there are any chemists in the room, I apologise in advance. 3D electron orbitals are incredibly difficult to represent on a slide, so we've gone for the GCSE version of electrical or electron orbitals. So, if we have a hydrogen atom, which is what I'm showing up on the screen, right? you've got a proton in the middle, you've got one electron orbiting around it. If you shine energy onto that hydrogen atom, say because you've got such incredible speeds of material moving around a black hole, which has increased the friction so that it glows, that can then hit the hydrogen atom and the electron uses that energy to jump up to the next energy level. It's not supposed to be there there, it's not supposed to be there though, so it drops back down and gives out light. 
And quantum mechanics tells us that there's only certain energy levels that the electron can be at that are stable, an electron around a proton. So the energy difference when this electron jump and drop back down happens is always exactly the same. You always get the same amount of energy out, which in the form of light means that you always get the exact same wavelength of light given out by hydrogen. So when we take that light and we split it through a prism, we get all the colors and the wavelengths and a trace of how much light of each wavelength you receive. If you have a lot of hydrogen there, you then expect a whopping big peak at this wavelength of, that we know that hydrogen gives out. That's what we expect to see, but that's not what we actually see. So this is the real data that I wanted to show you guys. I figured you'd love to see some real data of hydrogen that's orbiting around a supermassive black hole that we got from the Isaac and Newton telescope in La Palma. You can see it's not one big spike at one single wavelength. It's been smeared out. It's been broadened. And that's because the hydrogen is orbiting around the black hole. So what you're seeing here is a Doppler shift, right? You've got some of the hydrogen coming towards you, so its wavelength gets squashed to a smaller value, it gets blue shifted to a lower wavelength value. You've got some of the hydrogen moving away from you, so the wavelength gets stretched out and it gets moved to a, a, higher, uh, wave, a higher wavelength and it gets stretched out this way to a bigger value, a red shift. And so that's why we detect this broad peak rather than sort of a, a sharp peak instead. <laughs> Now, that, how broad that peak is, how much it's been smeared out, tells you how fast the hydrogen is actually moving around the black hole. And just like when we were looking at the stars around the center of the Milky Way's black hole before, if you know how fast the thing is, you know how fast the thing is moving, you know how massive the thing is that it's moving around. And so from this, you can measure the mass of a black hole. It's calibrated from nearby objects and everything where you can track individual clumps of matter moving. This is when you can just see the hydrogen gas and you have this whole broaden and you can end up with this equation essentially at the top there to convert the hydrogen emission that you see to black hole mass. And like I do this every day and it still doesn't fail to blow my mind that like we as humans can do this. Like how much science had to be figured out over the past century quantum mechanics chemistry, engineering for telescopes, the, the physics of it as well, all of that had to come together for us to be able to make this one simple looking measurement. Like, just ugh, goosebumps, goosebumps every time. But back to the, why we were doing this. Yes, it's cool, but you know, we really wanted to put them on this graph. And I'm just gonna warn you, this goes from black to white and it hurts my eyes, so in case it hurts your eyes, here's your warning, there we go. We're going back to this plot that we saw before, right, of the mass of a black hole against the mass of that central bulge of stars in the middle. That was our big argument like for co-evolution of black holes and galaxies, and it's caused by galaxy mergers. So I'm gonna put those 100 galaxies that we looked at on this plot now. You'll notice they are arrows, right? They are limits, data, because as we said before, you had that big bright purple spot in the middle that was the black hole lighting up and you could hide the bulge underneath it. So you basically say, how much bulge could I hide? That's the maximum limit, that's where the arrow starts, but it's probably somewhere over here. And the data point would actually shift, right? So that's what the little black arrows are. The red uh, points there are basically like normal galaxies that have been looked at before, the big blobs. And so what you can see here is that if they're all going to shift that way, they're not going to sit on the correlation at all. And if you take into account the fact they're going to shift, the fact they've got errors and uncertainties all over them as well, if you try and fit a best fit line, you essentially end up putting it somewhere in that dicky bow region, just like that grayed out region you've got there. That includes practically a vertical line. No correlation whatsoever because you can see these are just as massive as the supermassive black holes that have had have been grown in mergers. The two galaxies have come together, if not more massive in some cases for the fact that they've got no bulge in the center. And we can sort of turn to our, people, our friends, our colleagues that run simulations rather than use telescopes like I do, and say, hey, if you go through simulations and you do the same thing that we did, and you select the things that have never had a merger, how big are their black holes? You can then put them on the same plot, and you find almost like where the, the arrows of our data points that are limits would shift to if you could actually see it, which is pretty cool, I always think, to see that that agrees that way. No one had ever thought to look at this in simulations before. 
And when you do look at simulations, you can actually track it over time as well. You can rewind time and say, okay, how much actually have mergers contributed to the growth of supermassive black holes? And you find it's only 35%. 35% of all the mass in supermassive black holes right now comes from the only process that we thought could grow them. So 65% of the stuff in black holes got there another way. And essentially that is now what my more recent research is on, this growth pathway. How does it happen? What processes are driving it? What effects does it then have on the galaxy? Does the black hole grow more efficiently this way than a very chaotic merger? What does it do to the properties of the black hole? I'm sure like you're all familiar, once you get one result in science, it just spurs so many more questions and here we are still. Uh, this is 2017, we're still here six years later trying to figure this out. So that was really my black holes part of the talk for you. Because what I also do is then talk about my work and my colleagues' work on my YouTube channel as well, with the aim of being trying to cut out the middleman, really, so that the general public can hear about the latest astrophysics research from an astrophysicist themselves. So this was a video where I talked, that's a lovely screenshot, isn't it? That's a really great pause there. Uh, how, how do supermassive black holes grow? Same title as this talk. It was a week in the life of a, a conference that I went to. It was 2021 summer, so it was an at-home sort of conference, not quite locked down. Uh, where were we at that time? Uh, but it was all from home. It was a virtual conference. And it was a week in the life, essentially. And I explained the, the research that I was presenting during that conference at the same time as sort of showing off what other people were, were doing as well. So essentially what I do on my YouTube is I post a video once a week recapping whether it's the latest astronomy news or what you can see in the night sky right now. Like, did anyone see Jupiter on their way in before just in front of the museum? If not, I'll point it out when we get outside, it's gorgeous. Uh, or it might be an unsolved mystery or it might be challenging a big misconception about the universe, like the fact that black holes aren't holes like I talked about before. Just whatever I want to chat about that week. And I set it up in October 2018 and it's grown from, you know, like a handful of subscribers then to over 600,000 subscribers in five years, thanks to consistently posting that one video a week, you know, where possible around research and home life. It's not always easy, as Della said. Felt like full-time jobs at the while. You'd be pleased to know that it's now two part-time jobs. <laughs> nice getting a nice balance between research and, and YouTube. So back in 2018, though, I had a very naive perspective of sort of build the website and they will come. <laughs> I expected that because I was a young woman in science, I would therefore appeal to other young women and young girls who were interested in science and that would be the audience that I would reach just by being present online. I couldn't have been more wrong if I'd tried. Um, these are some stats, I think these are from back in February, 2020, February this year. Um, from the past sort of February 2023 to February 2022, in which the channel had 22 million views, which is great, but I was really aiming to reach a lot of women with what I do, and 10% of my viewers were female during that time. It's about 2 million, which is great, and I don't want to get rid of the, you know, 20 million men that are there, it's just, you're like, can we get some more women in there too, it would be great. Also, the majority of my viewers tend to be around 35 to 44, rather than the younger, maybe 18 to 24 demographic I originally thought I would reach. And also, unsurprisingly, they're from like, English-speaking countries, mostly. And there are some caveats when you look at these statistics like this, right? That you think, okay, well, maybe there are some young girls watching it, but on a family account that's perhaps registered like in a dad's name or something. Also, Google, if you don't tell it your gender, assumes your gender from your search history. So if your search history is not typically female, then it might just assume that you are male. So there's a lot, a lot of caveats in here. But while those caveats might account for a few percent, it's not a great enough effect to bring it to the 50-50 that we'd probably all like to see. I'm sure there are some sort of science fields, uh, you know, in people represented in the room here that have possibly the opposite problem. But in astrophysics, this is sort of the problem that we have in terms of a gender split. Now, most of these stats look similar to when I first started back in 2018, except for the gender split. When I started putting out videos that were getting a few thousand views, rather than 100,000 views that we get now, it was a lot worse. So this was the, the sort of stats from my first six months of regular once a week posting, and the gender split was 0.5% female. I have had to work to get that up to 10%, and it was not 
easy. Because what I want to try and get across to you today is that if you are doing engagement online, what you're always doing is fighting against recommendation algorithms on social media. So for me, that's YouTube is my main field, and thankfully the recommendation algorithm is not some big secret. It's described in a research paper by Covington, Adams and Sargon from 2016. It's a neural network, for those who are AI sort of familiar, it essentially decides what to recommend to you next in order to keep you on YouTube for the longest possible time. It's had some issues, I'm sure we've all read it in the news, how you start on YouTube on any video and you end up at a flat earth video. <laughs> like you can just fall down the conspiracy rabbit hole. They have thankfully fixed that now. That doesn't happen on YouTube anymore. But what it does, it works by taking information on what you've watched before, what you've searched for before, your geographic location, your age, and your gender to decide what to recommend to you. And not only that, but what other people of your age and your gender in your location have also watched before. So if you are, let's say, a 17-year-old girl logging onto YouTube for the first time, it doesn't have any information right, about you because you've logged onto it for the very first time. So it bases its recommendations on what other 17-year-old females in your area are also watching. So unless that girl specifically searches for science content, or if there is already a population of girls engaging with science content in her area, she's very, very unlikely to be recommended any science content on a social media platform. Essentially excluding her from the scientific narrative based on her gender and her age alone, which is a really scary thought for anyone who does science communication online. And not only do we get that exclusion, but then you get this elevation of white male voices as well. So here's a list of the top 25 science YouTubers by subscriber count. And every single one of these is led by one, if not two, white males. If you go down the list, the first females we get to are some mathematicians that present number files, so the likes of uh, Hannah Fry and Holly Krieger. But ultimately, like, the channel of number five, if you're familiar, is most famous for like James Grimes and Matt Parker, and it's run by a wonderful guy called Brady Horan as well. The first truly female-led science channels you get to are Simone Yates and Diana Cowan of Physics Girl at number 24 and 25. And the reason we think this is is because there's been many studies that have shown that on average on YouTube, male-led channels are watched by more male views, viewers and vice versa. So we get this like vicious cycle in the recommendation algorithm that elevates male voices in the science communication sphere, since that's what the algorithm has learned that men make and men like to watch, and it, it is it's vicious. Also, nearly every single person on this list is also white as well, so it's perhaps interesting to think how racial biases <coughs> might have also entered into the algorithm. It's perhaps not trained in, but still learned due to societal biases. There's some in the US that have suggested that due to redlining in the US that they have, that could, if it's based on geographic area, that could have a big impact on recommendation algorithms as well. It's not something I'm uh, as familiar with as the gender split that I've been focusing on, um, but interesting conversation I think none, nonetheless. So what do you do when you're fighting against an all-powerful AI recommendation algorithm that's apparently learned both sexist and racist societal biases? <laughs> um, you've got to trick it, essentially. That's what I've learn. You've got to make a video that is packaged on the outside to look like one thing and then it's just like, oh you clicked on this, bam, here's some signs. Social media platforms right, are built on trending topics, hashtags, right? anything that cross over those lines of hashtags and trending topics into a science video appearing as something else is how you get an algorithm to recommend a piece of content to a different demographic. Doing, tr doing true outreach and not just in reach, right, to be already interested. Because if you set up a social media account to communicate science to, pe to the people, you're gonna reach all the people that are filling the seats at public lectures already, right? They're already the people that are interested in the ones where you, RAS puts on a public lecture, for example. You know the faces that are gonna turn up. They're the people the algorithm's also gonna decide to put out the content to. So we as individuals and also societies as well, scientific societies, when we do psychom online, we need to be aware of this, otherwise we're just going to have one big echo chamber just doing in reach to all the usual suspects. So I want to give you a bit of an idea of what I've done to try and tackle this, but obviously with scientists we need a control to start with. So this is 
sort of what I class as one of my most popular hardcore science videos. It's about MOND, Modified Newtonian Dynamics. It's essentially an alternate theory to Einstein's theory of general relativity, the best theory of gravity. Um, it was about a research paper from my colleague Harry Desmond at Oxford. It's, I mean, it's the peak of YouTube's science clickbait, right? Without actually being clickbait, it's what we in the business have termed legit bait. It's like, oh, you're curious, are you? <laughs> click on this. Um, is essentially what it, what it works. It works as well. It gets people to click and watch. But sadly, of the seven hundred and fifty thousand views this had, two point five percent of those were female. And it's a trend I have noticed my more science heavy videos that the gender splits use that way. Again, I think it's a product of the algorithm. So the question is, can we still make a very science heavy video, but trick the algorithm into thinking it's something else? Let's start on a positive note with my biggest success story trying to do this. A day in the life of an astrophysicist, right? Day in the life videos are rife on YouTube. They're everywhere. Everything from like a Harvard student or a fitness guru to a London lawyer. And usually it's like, I start my day at 5am and I go on a jog and then I do some yoga and I have some cold oats I prepped the night before and then I do three hours of study and then look at the beautiful poke bowl I've prepared for my lunch. Right? And I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but also you can fit so much science content into those day of the life videos. And what I realised also from watching these videos myself is that the majority of Day in the Life videos were being made by women, but they were also had the comment section also were majority women. So conversation was also sort of coming from women as well. So if I wanted to reach more women, I needed to make a Day in the Life video. But I realised, you know, I could also explain, you know, what does an astrophysicist actually do? I could explain my research on galaxies and supermassive black holes. I could explain the image that I showed at the beginning of Messier 87's black hole, build people up to like a big science research result that, you know, had just been put in a research paper as well. But it's all packaged as a day in the life video so that the algorithm puts it out to different people and also different people click on it. And the good news is it works. It can be done, right? The increased reach of this video, female viewership, went up to over 28%. And I actually think, this was, like I said, from February, I took these screenshots, and I think when I checked this more recently, it had gone up to 35 40%. So you also look at the age range. The majority of viewers are 18 to 24 years old as well. And I'm really proud of this. Like, this isn't sort of a, a classic fire department science tobacco from a few years ago, right, where it was like, let's take apart a hairdryer, let's see. You know, it's not science for girls. Sometimes it gets packaged. It's just that the YouTube algorithm has learned women enjoy doing life videos. So I'll just recommend this video to them as well. And it's a, a normal, typical science video when you have to click on it. Obviously with YouTube and social media, you can get lost in numbers as well. So it's always really fun to look at the comments seeing comments from women who say they've been inspired to go on to do research or start a university education or just are just generally inspired in their life as well it was a really really nice comments to read i still am amazed that from chatting away in either my spare bedroom or my office at work you can have an impact on the trajectory of somebody's life like that it's quite incredible here's another example Meme reviews. Anybody ever watched a meme review on YouTube? Because personally, I don't get it, because when did explaining a joke ever become cool? Apparently it did. Essentially what I do is get people to send me astronomy-themed memes, laugh at it, and then explain the basic science behind it. Like, this one was sort of like the next Earth-like planet. Every time we find one, astronomers get very distracted, like the distracted boyfriend meme. Or from why like pictures of the moon that you take on your phone look so terrible because of just the field of view of your phone. Uh, just all sorts of different things. Uh, hopefully you can see this, this comment here from a reviewer behind me as well that I think hit the nail on the head of what I've been trying to do this entire time. Meme review was the Trojan horse to an educational video. Um, which I, think I, I, I think I've started to call it that, is the videos I make are Trojan horses to science. Um, someone else also commented from the US to say they learned more in that 15 minute video than they did from their entire high school education. Um, I don't know is uh, like whether it's a compliment to my video or just a criticism of the US high school system. <laughs> I'll take it either way. But the stats for this one though definitely showed how the video managed to reach more young people again uh, than I do normally on my channel. 
but the female percentage wasn't that significantly different. Apparently men like having jokes explained to them, but women don't. <laughs> That's what I took from that. So only a partial success in terms of the gender split on this one. Another series I started was an Astrophysicist Reacts series, and this was uh, inspired by uh, a medical doctor on YouTube called Dr. Mike, who reacts to medical dramas as well. I thought, yeah, I could do that with sci-fi. Thinking again that sci-fi is its own entertainment genre, I shouldn't be biased on gender. I you know, see a lot of women enjoying sci-fi. I see a lot of women in the comments section of reaction videos for various TV shows. So again, this would be the way that I could reach them. And the idea is you watch a show, you record your reactions, you essentially split apart. What's the science? What's the fiction here? And like, okay, this might have happened, but is there a different way that this could have happened in real life, for example? The Trojan also science content. Unfortunately, this didn't have the impact I hope it would. Apparently, the sci-fi genre is incredibly gendered, I didn't realise, because that's probably basically on me. Um, the 3% of females watching this video on the popular show, The Expanse, um, from Netflix, managed to bring down the age spread a bit to the 25 to 34 bracket, but not 18 to 24 like I originally wanted, which, let's face it, is probably just the target audience for this show, to be honest. So I thought, well, what about a sci-fi film with a female lead? One that I know inspired a load of women to become scientists. Contact with Jodie Foster. What a classic, right? I had actually never seen it either, and I had been told by colleagues that I would get disowned if I didn't remedy that fact immediately. But unfortunately, it made the female-male split worse, and also pushed to an older, older audience, who probably remember when the film was released in 1997, right? So that wasn't as successful. Then I thought, what about a recent sci-fi film with a female lead, like Don't Look Up, fronted by Jennifer Lawrence, right? People love Jennifer Lawrence. But it certainly did better than The Expanse of Contact with a 12% female split, but remember the average for the channel is around 10%, so I think this is a bit load up of statistics there. It's probably in the sort of variation that you would expect, not the same impact as like the Day in the Life video. So I racked my brain. And I'm still racking my brain of things I could possibly do. But I racked my brain thinking, what else can I do to reach more women? And I got very excited when I realised how many space references there were on Taylor Swift's Evermore and Folklore albums that she released <laughs> during lockdown. And as a huge Taylor Swift fan, I realised that this was my moment. <laughs> right? I decided to make a video explaining the science behind those references, like taking the lyric, rare is a glimmer of the comet in the sky, and explaining, where, what is a comet? Uh, how rare really are they? When is the next one visible that you can actually see? And I thought this would cross over into the Swifties area of the internet and be recommended to a huge proportion of female viewers, especially because there are also a lot of like essay videos on Taylor Swift, um, and her music and dissecting all of the, the lyrics in the music because they are so poetic and so I thought this is, this is going to be it. However, I think this is an example of my worst fail. <laughs> well, I'll let you be the judge of that. The majority of viewers were male and over the age of 45. <laughs> so it was a fail in what I was trying to do, but if we think about it, what I actually succeeded in doing was encouraging all the men to listen to Taylor Swift. <laughs> So not quite the engagement with the young people in science like I was gunning for, but still some form of a success. I guess we can, we can take that one just for our own sanity. So I'm still learning how to do this. And I can tell you my lessons learned in the hope it will also help with your own online engagement as well as if, if you're thinking about starting some form of social media account and thinking about how you can drive growth on some platforms, maybe for existing platforms, for research institutes or something, the Science Council, whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, all of us are at the mercy of these recommendation algorithms, whether it be YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or Threads or X, formerly known as Twitter. They also don't behave as we thought they might as well. Or they don't behave either as the original platforms, social media platforms that set it up intended either. But I hope that as more researchers become aware of this and don't have that build the website and they will come sort of naively that I did at the beginning, we might be able to bridge that educational digital divide, which I think is very much policed by those recommendation algorithms at the minute. So I'm going to leave you there. Those are my two split personalities that you've seen tonight. Black holes and YouTube, is, is, this is my thing. And I'm very happy to take questions now, whether it be about black holes or whether it be 
about the YouTube algorithm. Uh, and remember, I told you, you had to decide which one was the more interesting, <laughs> astrophysics, astrophysics or YouTube. Thanks very much. <laughs>
Department of the Academy for Healthcare Science. We're really delighted to be here this evening and to listen to this. Um, yesterday, I was uh, listening and contributing to a uh, thank you to a recruitment um, exercise that the NHS was looking to put on, mm -hmm. and I just really feel I'd love to rewind it and say to them, uh, "Can you listen to this? Because it's such a impactful." Uh, information. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for having me. <laughs> I've just got a quick question uh, about the supermassive black holes, which mm -hmm. is the other side of your, your presentation. Is there any? What happens when it gets super, super, super massive? <laughs> What's after that? Yeah. So, is there a limit to how big yeah. a black hole can get? Yes. So the way that I was sort of arguing now that black holes grow is sort of like a very slow and steady wins the race sort of a, a way of growth which is gas comes down spiral arms and gets funneled to the very center and then it gets accreted so essentially the gas is orbiting the black hole you somehow have to get it to lose energy to fall in and so that happens through collisions between particles they lose energy some gain and, and get away and some lose and end up falling into the black hole but to, have to do that, they have to cross sort of like the last stable circular orbit you can have around a black hole due to gravity. And as a black hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, that gets pushed out further and further to the point where the gas is more attracted to itself than it is the black hole. We think that limit, it changes whether the black hole is spinning or not, just for fun. That limit though is around about, let's say tops out at 100 billion times the mass of the sun. So we feel like black holes stall when they get to that point, but there's nothing to say they can't merge with another black hole to say double the mass still. That could still happen. Or if there's something on like a direct trajectory towards the black hole, it would probably end up growing the black hole. But the, the way that this the process that happens through accretion would stall. And so the biggest black hole we think we've ever found, Ton 618, for an invented name, I don't name things very well in astronomy. Um, that's around about 70 or so billion times the mass of the sun. So it's reaching that limit, especially because if the black hole is spinning, it brings it down a little bit, that limit. So it's interesting to think that we found a black hole that's reached that, that black holes might sort of be slowing down and have reached their maximum point and maybe have already winked out as well, because as soon as that accretion process stalls, that's the thing that lights up the gas around the black hole. So you also wouldn't see them there anymore either or be able to measure their mass and, and work out how massive they are so very interesting question and it makes us all wonder whether we're reaching that stage of the universe is sort of evolution yes. so my question is <coughs> if you look at science traditionally the sort of physics and theoretical physics is very much more male orientated than perhaps biology so have you compared your demographics against someone who's doing something similar to you, but more in a biological field? Um, I haven't spoken to someone. I do know a few people in the, in the medical field who do YouTube, so perhaps I should ask them. I've spoken to people who do general science interest on YouTube, and they said their stats are very similar, and they were very surprised at that because it was male-led channels, and they thought because I was a woman I would have more female viewership and didn't. Um, so, you know, there is sort of surprise across the board that it doesn't just increase, but I guess that's the way of things. Um, what I think is really interesting in terms of comparing across subjects, I mean, it's this typical problem that we've, we've struggled with for years, right, is that how do you get more girls into physics, computer science, maths? Well, you know, you've got to get more boys into English language and, you know, sort of psychology and everything like that to balance everything out. I feel like a lot of the efforts is girls into STEM, but there's not a lot of efforts with the, the boys into, you know, sort of more traditionally art subjects. And I know that the um, Ogden Trust and the Institute of Physics have done a lot on this. And the Institute of Physics looked at what age you have to go into schools to combat that physics and maths aren't for girls perspective that seems to come and get ingrained into both boys and girls and stops them from picking those subjects at A level and GCSE and wherever it might be. And it's age seven, not year seven, age seven. That's when like societal sort of stresses from teachers or from family members or friends 
get ingrained in like that's a boy's toy and that's a girl's toy and it, that's where it comes from so whether what I'm describing is literally an issue that we've had since you know, kids were seven years old and it's that's how it's now showing itself on social media I'm not sure or whether it's just the, the fault of the algorithms but perhaps the algorithms have just learned the same societal biases you know, it's hard to say. And I think that is a very good idea, seeing if I can find someone who's doing biology or climate science or medicine to ask them, you know, if they have the same issues. This might be a really dumb question. No, no such thing. <laughs> um, can you associate an age with the supermassive black mm. holes? And if so, is there a correlation between the age of them and their mass? Unfortunately not. That information is white. You might have heard of the phrase of hairy black holes. <laughs> black holes have no hair, is the idea. So, uh, the phrase that comes from, I uh, think, Roy Kerr, and uh, New Zealand mathematician, uh, physicist, you know. And um, what this essentially means is that as material goes into the black hole, becomes part of the black hole, it loses any information of what it was made of. So, for example, some people ask, you know, can you tell if a black hole is 50% hydrogen and 20% helium and whatever percent carbon? No, all that information is also erased. Um, when the material was incre like accreted and taken in, also erased. You don't know any of the past history uh, of the black hole, the material that fell into it. So, age is a, is a strange sort of thing to put onto a black hole. You can age a galaxy from its oldest star that has, it has in it, which in some way might age the black hole. But there is uh, something that I like to call the astrophysics equivalent of the chicken or the egg, which is, did the black hole come first and then the galaxy of stars form around it? Or did a galaxy of stars form, one go supernova, make a black hole, which then grew to become supermassive? And so if you're aging the star, are you really aging the black hole? Or not, is, is sort of an interesting question. But it's hopefully something that the James Webb Space Telescope on you. On your shiny toy. I can't believe I gave a whole talk about astrophysics and didn't mention the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, but um, did now, it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, that's where we that's something that will be able to answer is sort of what came first, and then perhaps you might be able to put some sort of age on the typical, at least the typical formation epoch in the universe's history that the progenitors to supermassive black holes were formed. Hmm. Becky, that was absolutely brilliant. Glad <laughs> you enjoyed it. We really, really enjoyed it. Um, and we hope you appreciate that we made this an evening event because we knew that would be at the beginning of your working day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because we don't usually have nocturnal keynote <laughs> speakers. I'm sure that lots of people will want to talk to you um, later. I'm going to close the um, part of the evening that takes place in, in this room at the moment um, by thanking all of you who've come together tonight to support continuous professional development of the pan-scientific community. And I'm going to invite you to leave by the upper exits to go across the corridor where, with a bit of luck, there are drinks and sparkling conversation. Can we just thank Becky one more time?